Welcome to our CyberTalks interview series. I'm Wyatt Cash on behalf of CyberScoop, and I'm here with Ann Johnson, Corporate Vice President for Security, Compliance, and Identity at Microsoft. Ann, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Wyatt. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, as you know, uh, there's been a lot thrown at Chief Information Security Officers in 2020. Um, how would you describe what's changed in the way of you know, their role in their organizations? Yeah, I think for CISOs, um, while they still are really are required to be very technical in their roles, they have taken on a real business aspect of their roles, and they're doing a lot more reporting out to the board of directors. They're talking a lot more to chief risk people, to chief financial people within their organizations. So they've really had to marry that technical knowledge with really a lot of business aptitude. And a lot of the folks came up in technical jobs, right? So they, they, they've done an extraordinary job. By the way, credit to anyone who is in a CISO chair right now, because they've done an extraordinary job under a tremendous amount of pressure. Even for the attacks you see in the news, there's thousands we stop every day you don't see because of the work of the CISOs and their teams. But they really have had to become much more business people with a technical bend to them as opposed to pure technical folks. And next, I'd like to ask, um, workforces are now so much more distributed than they were just months ago. Uh, what concepts do you believe will help um, make that shift continue to work successfully between zero trust and multi-factor authentication and other techniques that have been in the pipeline but now need to be more fully so? Yeah, I think that, so there's a few things, right? We've seen a significant increase in zero trust adoption because it allows organizations to be much more flexible and interrogating explicitly every th single transaction that comes into the environment. We've seen a proliferation of multi-factor authentication because if you're going to be working remotely, and by the way, I believe you should use multi-factor authentication 100% of the time, whether you're inside the network or, or working remotely, but we've seen an increase in it. We've also seen an increase in virtualization, right? In Windows virtual desktops or in virtualization um, for folks that need to have more compute capacity. You know, think about developers working from home full time versus a, a front office worker, right? They need more compute capacity. So the ability to securely deliver and to be really flexible and scalable and agile and delivering virtual computing to folks so they can um, scale up and down, even in their own workspace, not even in the cloud. And that's the final thing I'll say. The cloud allows us to, you know, the, the proliferation of the cloud and digital transformation in the past six months has been tremendous because the cloud actually allows you to have this flexibility of scaling up and down sessions, putting in security postures and measures of actually installing servers in your data center and doing things like scaling up Windows virtual sessions and virtualization for folks that need more compute capacity while they're working remotely. Well, next, I'd like to turn to uh, emerging technologies and supply chain concerns as well. You know, IoT devices and the data that they're streaming are now kind of converging with traditional data systems. We've got 5G, which means we're going to have so much more data streaming in. So, um, you know, obviously that means that technology departments are going to have to handle a lot more uh, and deal with those improvements. But with those improvements come some supply chain concerns. So how, how do you think about how um, government and industry should collectively handle those concerns while also making sure that we're not falling behind in those emerging technologies? Yeah, so supply chain is such a complex topic because it, it's not just about, you know, the supply chain of us delivering a solution, right? It's about contractors and consultants that are working in our environment. It's about the software you're downloading to use in your environment. It, you can't put supply chain into one bucket because it's actually a very broad topic. So here's what I would say. In IoT, of course, the proliferation of IoT advice is only going to continue. Everything about security is a risk-based decision. And our ability, we think about IoT, for example, I'll use that specifically in a couple of different ways. We think about what we call brownfield IoT devices, the legacy devices that can't necessarily be patched and updated. And we think about the new devices, but at the end of the day, every single one of those devices is going to behaving, be behaving in an expected manner and sending off signal that it's behaving in an expected manner. And if it doesn't behave in that expected manner, it should be sending up flags in a machine learning or an artificial intelligence engine and those flags then need to get to the stock. What this means then is that you actually have to do things like um, you know, basic security controls, like reducing SOC admin fatigue, using machine learning to help prioritize the highest value tasks for your SOC admins, and using a tremendous amount of automation to remediate the low level tasks. It's a, no matter what security problem you're trying to solve, 
at the end of the day, it all comes, you know, devices have a behavior, the you know, behavioral learning pattern. You need to learn what those patterns are. Humans have a learning pattern. You need to learn what those patterns are, and then you need to look for anomalies. And that will help just putting in those, I wouldn't say fundamental, because some, some of them are reasonably sophisticated, but just putting in those security controls will help you with your supply chain. The other thing I'll say with supply chain, I say it all the time, so people are used to saying it, is your supply chain humans need to be using multi-factor authentication all of the time. And your supply chain devices also need to be authenticating, whether it's certificate-based or other types of authentication, but they need to be authenticated also. Well, lastly, I'd like to just ask a little bit about workforce and skills development. Uh, you know, as cyber threats continue to grow, uh, you know, organizations continue to face a persistent challenge of recruiting and keeping those cybersecurity professionals up to par with their skills. So um, what, how do we close some of these gaps in both talent and skills? Uh, and what more can education and training uh, institutes do, as well as enterprises themselves and uh, kind of closing those gaps? You know, we've seen a huge increase in training programs focused on cybersecurity, whether it's through SANS or Black Hat or DEF CON or there's a, the Diana Initiative. We, we've kicked off initiatives with LinkedIn where we have an objective to train and we've trained 10 million people, some of those on cyber skills. So we need, uh, you've seen more courses in high schools, you've seen more courses in universities. Here's what I would say. You need to keep filling the pipeline in high schools and universities, and you need to keep incenting people to want to have cybersecurity careers. But for professionals already in the workforce, we need to do a couple of things. Number one, we need to be willing, actually, to train people. One of the things that you see, and every time I open a job, by the way, I inspect the job opening to make sure that I'm not asking for some requirements that no one is possibly going to ever meet, or there's five people in the U.S. that are, that are qualified. There are some jobs that are high level skill based that you're going to need something very specific, but they're the minority. We actually as an industry have to be much more open to the possibilities of retraining people, bringing people into the industry, giving them the skills that they need on the job, because we're not going to solve the problem if we keep saying that we want the same people with the same educational background, the same background, the same experience, the same experiences, right? We need to be, you know, I, I say, and I've been quoted as saying, our teams need to be as diverse as the problems we're trying to solve. That is very true. It doesn't hurt to have a liberal arts person taking a look at your security machine learning because they're going to come in from a different perspective. And that's the type, we just need to be a lot more open than we've historically been in the industry. That plus the combination of filling the pipeline through high school and university programs will ultimately get us to a good place. Well, those are some great points. Uh, Ann Johnson, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today and for uh, taking time to be with us. Thank you, Wyatt. Have a great day. Three, two, and one.